thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So um, uh, for those of you who heard the sort of chit chat in the preliminary technical part of the of the discussion, getting things up and running, this is my first big Zoom talk. So uh, um, I, uh, the theorem I think is really beautiful and especially on behalf of my collaborators, Greg Perkaleko at Texas A&M, Shiza Kanzani here at UNC and Graham Cox at Memorial University in Newfoundland. Um, all, uh, anything that uh, comes off, uh, I think is uh, totally a, an indication of my uh, inexperience with the, with the medium, but I hope I can at least communicate some of the ideas and the, the, the framework for uh, the theorem that uh, I'm going to present today, which is about uh, a local test for global extrema um, in a dispersion relation of a periodic graph. So I'm going to try to be very uh, careful about defining a lot of these terms because I recognize that a lot of people in spectral geometry may not work necessarily in these notion of sort of periodic crystals or periodic graphs. Um, I think it's growing in popularity, but uh, I'm going to start off with a somewhat gentle introduction to give an idea of the models. Um, and then I will uh, and give some motivation. I'll try to make some very precise definitions of the type of operators that we are considering. Um, do a quick overview of the proof, uh, which I hope will be informative. Um, and uh, look at some examples and what I call counterexamples, which may not sound like something you want to present for a theorem, but uh, what I really mean by that are uh, we have very precise conditions on when our theorem holds. And I will show you that if you break those conditions, uh, uh, you, you, you can see that they are necessary to some extent. Okay, and then I'll talk a little bit about future work. Um, and I'd really like to thank again, the organizers for the invitation to do this and for everyone for being here. Um, okay, so what's the underlying idea? Uh, we would like to think about so-called band edges um, to identify gaps in the spectrum of a periodic combinatorial graph, okay? So if you don't know a lot of about what that means, um, I'm gonna try to define those things carefully. Um, if you do, then you may uh, recognize that there are some kind of related ideas uh, because we're talking about the spectrum from early work of my collaborator, Greg Berkeleiko and Yves Colon de Verdier in around 2013, where they were studying uh, properties of eigenfunctions on combinatorial graphs and in eigenvectors, I should say, and really looking at the nodal count, the number of nodal domains, and came up with a sort of magnetic-like Laplacian condition that determined uh, whether and uh, what the count of that uh, uh, of that nodal the number of nodal domains for that eigenvector were. And so this this is an interesting. Uh, it's an unrelated because we're going to talk about operators where we have an underlying sort of complex structure that looks a bit like a magnetic perturbation arising naturally in the model. But of course, some of the insights that we especially have from Greg with respect to uh, uh, what the local spectrum looks like and how you analyze spectrum near uh, a, a critical point of these types of operators played a big role. So I encourage people if you're interested in nodal domains, uh, that's, those are really beautiful works. Um, and they can also be extended to things like quantum graphs. And um, it's, a, it's, a neat, it's a neat topic and it, it kind of set the precursor for the types of graphs that we're going to consider. Um, which I'll just point out from a physical perspective, arise it often in, in physics in so-called tight binding models. So what you can imagine is, uh, you know, you have a Schrodinger operator that's got very deep wells and you can attempt to analyze a crystal in terms of approximating the states by looking at low lying parts of the spectrum. And what that gives you is sort of like a discrete Schrodinger type operator or a discrete Laplacian type operator. And if there's underlying periodicity, then uh, you're gonna sweep over a domain of possible boundary conditions. Um, and those, that sweeping out produces you know, bands of spectrum. Um, and where those bands do not exist, there are gaps in the energy level. And those, create, those bands and the, and the gaps create important physical properties of this you know, model material, okay? And again, I'm being a bit informal, but I will remind you very, so with this simple uh, review of just simple uh, periodic spectral theory, which again, I apologize to anyone who's familiar with these things, but let's take a simple example where we look at a Schrodinger operator with a periodic potential. Okay, and I just chose period one because uh, it makes uh, two pi show up naturally on the dual. 
Um, and the spectrum of this can be defined via a family of eigenvalues. I call them mu1 of k. And in this case, it's an infinite family because obviously the Laplacian on a compact domain has an infinite spectrum. And we sweep over these values, uh, which I've, I've changed it almost everywhere, but uh, we'll use alpha instead of k regularly throughout to represent the types of uh, quasi-momenta that we're talking about. I apologize that it's k here. But the point is, in this continuum Schrodinger example, you can look at the, at the infinite number of discrete eigenvalues for each k, where basically you solve the eigenvalues of the Schrodinger operator with modified boundary conditions that essentially does like a complex rotation at the end of the boundary, OK? And uh, the, you plug in that e to the i k x, and essentially what you realize is you get something that looks a bit like a magnetic Schrodinger operator um, for each k, OK? And for each k, that gives you an eigenvalue. You trace out the values of that eigenvalue over the family of k's, and that's your band, OK? That's essentially the, the spectral bands that we're looking at, OK? Um, and so th those sweep out uh, what we call these dispersion curves. And the maximal and minimal values give you, a, you know, an, a, an energy band at which you could expect to see, uh, 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 if you were thinking of a scattering problem, that's energies that you would expect to see able to penetrate into the crystal. And gaps are sort of where you, you cannot, OK? OK, so obviously, uh, higher dimensional versions of that exist for Schrodinger operators. Um, and as I mentioned, we can uh, approximate these Schrodinger operators by these matrix operators, um, usually in this limit where we assume a potential well to be extremely deep. OK, so that's kind of the, the gist of the idea, is that we want to understand the, the sweep outs of these eigenvalues in a periodic problem. Um, and that there's a comparable version of that for discrete Schrodinger type operators or discrete Laplacian type operators. And those are the types of things we're going to study. And we're going to analyze what properties you could look at locally to determine when you would be at a band edge. Okay. And in particular, I'll note that since we're going to be handling matrices, obviously we won't have an infinite number of bands. We will have a finite number of bands depending on the number of elements inside a cell. Okay. Okay. So just as a quick background in where these models come from, uh, tight binding models have existed for a long time. There's a really lovely old work from 1947 that's very fun to read if you've never read it by Wallace. Um, there is also a lot of recent work on convergence to tight binding limits by Charlie Pfefferman, James Lee Thorpe, and Michael Weinstein. And I learned about a bunch of these models by working with optical physicists, in particular Mikhail Rexman and uh, various others uh, that have come through the group of Moti Segev, where they actually experimentally build optics that they can see these lattice type operators being a very good approximation for. Okay, so this is by no means a thorough accounting of where these models come from. Um, but these are some places where you can get a flavor for where these uh, matrix operators might arise. Okay. Jeremy. Uh, yes. Uh, there exists some quasi-periodic crystals, right, which are related to some uh, uh, like five-fold symmetry and so on. Uh, can you define something similar uh, in that case or does it make sense? Yeah, so absolutely. So that's a cool question. So, uh, okay, so nothing that we're going to talk about would directly apply to things that are quasi uh, periodic, but the way that, so there are a lot of physicists who do indeed study quasi periodic structures and they still look at bands and gaps. And indeed the spectrum gener generically still has bands and gaps. The way that I know the physicists model this is by taking a very large cell of quasi periodicity and then doing periodic repetitions thereof. If you, if you understand that that actually for low energies should be a reasonable approximation, that would certainly fit into our machinery. Okay, okay. Does that make some uh, sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just, okay. I, I think I, there are some things which are projections of higher dimensional periodic things onto lower dimensional subspace. Oh, sure, but... so yes, if you understand that it is indeed higher, like our, our, we, there, there are, there, we have one theorem for which there, well, one and a, and a third of our theorems have no, have no, per, have no dimensional restrictions. So if you really understand that you have a periodic structure in higher dimensions and you can represent it as a, as a matrix operator, then yes, our theorem would apply. Okay, thank you. No problem. 
Um, but of course, so I will say though, that's, there's a caveat. It would apply in the higher dimensional system. What happens if you take slices through it? Uh, that can be of course, very complicated and I, I'm not making any claims about that. Okay. Um, so I wanted to give a, just a really simple example that's very uh, sort of commonly used to develop intuition in the physics literature. And it's called the SSH model, okay? And I've written down for you a model matrix here at the bottom. I give a bunch of descriptions of it as well in the, in the, but in the language. But the bottom line is we're, you can think about studying this matrix operator as a function of alpha, uh, where alpha ranges uh, uh, between 0 and 2 pi, right? And we can see, so the picture here is that we have two entries in a fundamental periodic cell and they have an intercell uh, intercell hopping rate of something like v and then an intracell hopping rate of something like w okay and the rate then translates to this model matrix hamiltonian and we can study the spectrum of that as it varies in alpha and it's a it's got a beautiful formula ah i forgot to change that k to an alpha i apologize i caught it i thought so many places um, but uh, if I exchange alpha with K, my apologies, this is a, the, a formula for the eigenvalues of that, of, the, uh, of, the, of that matrix, okay? And so in particular, uh, I should have plus and minus, okay? I apologize for that. But what we see is that the spectrum of this will uh, vary depending on the relationship between V and W, okay? And in particular, uh, we see that if V or W is zero, then, let me write this carefully. Eh, sorry. Then we have these flat band structures, okay? We see that if V equals W, we have, oh my goodness, sorry about that. Still getting used to iPad talks on slides, obviously. Uh, we have uh, something degenerate. Okay. And otherwise, we have uh, a gap opening up. Okay. And the point is that, uh, well, this is a simple model uh, that has important physical attributes in terms of its spectrum. In particular, uh, it's, in certain regimes of V and W, you're able to construct, uh, if you truncate this object, you're able, this period, periodic structure, you're able to construct modes that live at the edges in a nice stable fashion. And that has important physical implications, okay? So I only really give you this example to motivate the style of matrix operators that we are going to be looking at, because this type of Hermitian matrix with dependence upon uh, a matrix, uh, you know, a complex exponential that varies over, uh, over a period is exactly the type of model that we're gonna set up to study. But it's very important for us that there only be what we call a one crossing per edge condition. And that's gonna limit some of the physical examples that we can consider. So in particular, a lot of topological physics occurs by looking at hopping between neighbors and next nearest neighbors. And if you get into higher dimensions, those can give multiple crossings across of periodic cells and our theorems will not necessarily work, will not work in those cases really. Um, and I'll talk a bit about why. Um, but in many of the standard, let me say non-topological examples of which I'll give a few, um, our theorem perfectly represents the structure of the Hamiltonian that arises, okay? Okay, so uh, again, we're motivated by these type of problems and we wanna think about generic graph operators and we really wanna understand their band structures, okay? And in particular, we're gonna ask a question about their extrema. So, you know, if you just think about the, the dispersion surfaces, uh, you're going to sweep out a, 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 some kind of surface if it's two-dimensional uh, in terms of the alpha dependence or a higher dimensional, you know, hyperplane type object in, uh, uh, in, uh, in higher dimensions. Uh, 
And we really want to understand only their, their limits. Okay, we, for us, that's our main goal, is when have you reached a band edge, okay? All right, so that's the, I hope, not too terribly distracting informal discussion of the family of models that we're considering. And now let me give you some precise definitions. But really what I want you to take to heart from that discussion is what we're gonna study are N by N matrices that have dependence on some set of complex exponentials, which we will vary over a period, okay? So the full object that we're gonna look at actually acts on little L, but we're thinking about the spectrum of some self-adjoint matrix, or you know, really operator acting on little L2 of a graph. And so we're really thinking about this as a periodic tiling, and we're gonna think about operators acting on little L2 of the whole space over that periodic tiling, much like we looked at the Floquet block theory reminder for um, continuum Schrodinger operators with periodic potentials, okay? And again, we're gonna call this graph to say we have one crossing edge per generator, what turned out to be a very key condition for us, okay? If the graph itself is connected and there's a fundamental so choice of fundamental domain where there are exactly two D adjacent pairs that cross over uh, the fundamental cell. So I'll show you a picture of this uh, in just a second, okay? So given those D crossings, we have D parameters, alpha one to alpha D, which are the quasi-momenta, and they live on a torus, which is called the Brion zone. I will not deviate from this definition throughout this talk for the sake of simplicity, but I will say many times physicists do two things they uh, consider a diffeomorphism acting on the fundamental domain to simplify things, and that would not change our theorem. But sometimes they also take unitary transformations of the operator, and that would change our, te our theorem. So, part it, so if you want, worry about the torus being the domain and whether or not it handles other fundamental cells, don't. But if you worry about unitary representations, do, okay? Um, Okay, and so then we take that operator H, which we think of as defined on all of little L2 on these periodic tilings uh, generated by the square lattice or structure of the symmetry, and we form a new operator, T of alpha, which is a matrix operator with N by N coefficients where there were N elements in the unit cell, um, and it depends smoothly on this parameter alpha, which parameterizes the edges that go through uh, the periodic tilings, okay? So N is the number of vertices in the fundamental domain, and D is the periodicity of the, of the lattice, if you will, okay? Or, or is the dimension of the, of, the, of the lattice. Okay, we index the eigenvalues of those matrices. This gives us functions of alpha, and we will have N, a capital N of them, which we index by little n, okay? and uh, that creates a branch. And when we look at uh, the full range of those, we're gonna call that the spectral band. And like I said, the, the, the Floquet block theory on these matrices is that the union of those spectral bands is indeed the whole spectrum of that periodic, periodic operation, operator age on all of little L2. In the same way that big L2, when I had the periodic potential operator for the Schrodinger, for the periodic potential for the Schrodinger operator, could be defined by the union over all of these uh, uh, compact problems, okay? Okay, and like I said, the key thing is that this kind of determines uh, the energies at which the waves can propagate through the medium. That's an important, is, you know, you have to be at a frequency that the, that the crystal can feel, okay? All right, I will briefly uh, uh, shift to say, you know, to differentiate between another very cool recent work done by Alexi Drouot, um, where he studied similar, although slightly more general, because his can handle these topological models, he did not need the one crossing edge per generator condition. And he looked at what happens if a degeneracy forms between two bands, which is kind of the complementary question. And he was able to prove that they are generically conic, and these very, these conic uh, degeneracies are very important, obviously, in physics as well, related to graphene and so on and so forth. 
Um, and so I wanted to highlight that it's still a study of properties of the spectrum of these families of, her, of these, you know, Hermitian matrices. Um, but it's asking a slightly different question. It says, what happens when the bands degenerate? Whereas we're asking kind of the complementary question, um, we don't want the bands to degenerate. We want to be at an edge and determine when we can quantify that we're at an edge, okay? So that's just this comment that we're um, concerned about the gaps in band edges, okay? Any questions before I uh, move on to kind of state and show some examples? Jeremy, and maybe at the end of the talk, could you give some very, very simple example when this one crossing per edge condition is not satisfied to yes. just, just to get a feel of how it looks like? That is uh, one of my counter examples that I promised you earlier. So ah, okay, you will absolutely you. see that. Yeah, no, uh -huh. no problem. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so here is um, uh, just my standard set of examples. Okay, so these are uh, a couple of my favorites. Uh, the Obviously, the first one is the standard Haldane lattice, okay? And here you see that we did not represent the fundamental domain as a torus, but indeed as a parallelogram. That's the sort of standard so-called Brion zone for the lattice, but it, it does involve this diffeomorphism. Uh, and there is a diffeomorphic representation where you can just go over the torus. And so this is a totally legitimate example. And you see, uh, uh, to Dima's question, uh, let me uh, change my color a little bit here, right? I only crossed over the zone with one edge per edge, okay? Similarly, one of my very personal favorites, and I've done some work on this both in the continuum problem um, and on this lattice and its bifurcate, and it's sort of uh, various forms of bifurcation. Oh, let me be consistent with my color, my apologies. So the Brion zone now literally is just the two torus, okay? And you see we have three elements contained inside. So here we had two elements, and this would be a two by two matrix parameterized by uh, uh, an alpha vector in T2. And here we have a three by three matrix parameterized by an alpha vector in T2, okay? And uh, uh, both of those fit into our machinery. However, this uh, augmented Lieb lattice, quote unquote, where we added an extra edge, you'll notice uh, does not because now I have two crossings, uh, two edges going through the fundamental domain. Does that make sense? And uh, like I said, the unfortunate thing is that this uh, kind of rules out uh, what we would typically think of as something like a next nearest neighbor interaction. And I would love to understand more what our local characterization can tell us about band edges. Part of our theorem could allow for some complexity, but not more than one crossing per band edge, but a part of our theorem really requires uh, so, some real symmetric behavior. And I'll try to, I'll highlight both of those things. Uh, Jeremy? Yes. Uh, so there are many choices of fundamental domain. Is it yes. always clear that uh, this property is invariant and, uh, you know, if you change the fundamental domain, is it clear yeah. that this is? So in fact, we have a, uh, I forget if it's a, if it's a corollary or a theorem, but in fact, for as long as you transfer the fundamental domain from the, tor from the torus to this new domain with a diffeomorphism, our result goes through completely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent point. Cool. Okay, so these are some graphs. And then this one, so like, uh, you know, uh, for lack of a, <laughs> uh, just to be extra clear, this one does not work with our theorems for now. We'd like to understand what, if anything, we could say, but our theorem as stated does just does not work in this capacity. And we can show you examples of exactly why that is, okay? So like I said, we're now interested in this function. Let's pick an N. Uh, in our index of eigenvalues, and let's vary it over over alpha, okay? And <clears throat> one thing that I want to point out is uh, we're gonna since we're working at a at a band edge, we want to assume that this is simple, okay? At the point alpha zero. So what what that I want to reiterate uh, 
that does not mean that the band couldn't have another end that's at the same level for another alpha. It just means that at that particular alpha, that is a distinct eigenvalue, right? Which is another way of saying we're not at a degeneracy point, okay? It's really, a, it's a simple eigenvalue of T of alpha zero, okay? Then, uh, you know, you look at, I don't know, Kato, Reed and Simon, et cetera. It, we have a real analytic function of alpha in a neighborhood of alpha zero, okay? And we're gonna study behavior of that, uh, of that object, okay? So I need to introduce a few definitions of important quantities in order to state our theorem. The theorem in the end is pretty easy to state in terms of basically saying, you build a matrix locally, you analyze that matrix locally, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about whether or not that critical point is a band edge. Uh, of a, but uh, the matrices will depend on some of the structures, okay? So I want to understand what the local gradient of the eigenvalue is at a given point. And that we can define by a matrix that we'll call B acting on the corresponding eigenvector that we call F0, okay? So just to clarify that, F0 is the normalized eigenvector at, alpha, at lambda of alpha 0. And B is now this matrix. Of course, any of you who've ever done any spectral perturbation theory, you understand where this comes from. Uh, we're going to take the, the it's going to be an N by D matrix. So remember, N is the number of vertices in the fundamental cell. D is the period, is, is the dimensions of the periodic lattice. And it's going to be an N by D matrix where we take the gradient with respect to alpha of T of alpha F0. Okay. And of course, we, we uh, uh, evaluate it at alpha zero. Now that, so B is of course N by D, and obviously the dimensionality makes sense. B star is D by N. Okay, it's the adjoint. Okay. We also define the Hessian at a, at a given point in the sweep out of that function by twice the real part of a matrix. And again, that matrix can be computed directly. Uh, uh, it is, uh, what we'll call omega, which is an important matrix for our, for our theorem. Um, and then the same matrix B makes an appearance, B star more Penrose pseudo inverse of T minus lambda B, okay? So what is omega? Omega is simply the Hessian of the quadratic form of T acting on the given eigenfunction, okay? And again, like I said, that superscript plus we'll, we'll use as our notation for the more Penrose inverse, okay? So the two matrices, the matrices that it's, imp the matrices that it's important to discuss at this point are uh, B, just given by taking a gradient of T alpha F, right? Uh, omega, which is a Hessian of T alpha F dot F times a half, okay? And, uh, and W, uh, which is a combination of omega B and the more Penrose inverse of T minus lambda. Okay. Now that's a lot to take in. I'm going to try to walk us through where these things arise, but well, the truth is where these things arise is a direct computation using standard spectral perturbation theory of perturbing and looking at the local structure of the eigenvalue near a simple eigenvalue given a parameterization of a matrix. Okay. The, 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 we're really not doing anything, uh, mind blowing here. These are pretty standard definitions, but it turns out there's a lot of information contained in these pieces. And in particular, I will point out that the Hessian, so the local character of the surface for the second derivative test is characterized by the real part of this matrix W. Okay. And sometimes it turns out that the imaginary part of that matrix W, the, the imaginary part also contains information. And that's what we're gonna, we're gonna use that information to prove our global, our global theorem, okay? Because everything that I'm telling you now is purely local, okay? All right, so again, the second derivative test is just saying, is the real part of W positive definite? If so, great, I've got a local minimum. Is it negative definite? Great, I've got a local maximum. But 
it's really amazing that I can actually determine that those are local, that those are global maxima if I know something more about the matrix W in and of itself, not just its real part, okay? And notice W can be completely written down locally, right? Omega uh, is a Hessian with respect to the eigenvalue. Uh, B is uh, a property of the matrix and the eigenvector. Uh, and uh, sorry, a Hessian with respect to the matrix and the eigenvector. B is, a, is the Jacobian of the, of, the, of the matrix acting on the eigenvector. Uh, and the more Penrose inverse can be done completely using projections locally, okay? Ooh, sorry about that. Okay, so what's our first theorem? Our first theorem is not yet characterizing exactly a test for global extrema, but it tells us that that matrix W actually is the determinant, it was what determines the, the global structure, okay? So in particular, Let's take a periodic self-adjoint operator that has some matrix characterizations, right? So H is the operator on little l2. The, the periodic representation of our matrices are what we call T, okay? And assume that we have a simple eigenvalue at lambda of alpha zero of that matrix representation T of alpha zero. We also will assume that the corresponding eigenvector is non-zero on at least one end of a crossing edge, okay? So what does that mean? It means that I have two vertices where an edge crosses the fundamental domain. Of course, that eigenvector will take values on both those vertices, and I would like at least one of those to be non-vanishing, okay? That's a pretty generic property. Um, there are ways in which we can sometimes simplify some of these assumptions, but let's not, let's not get into that at this point. Um, and what we realize is, so what we realize is that if the whole matrix, so W, it's still a Hermitian matrix. It still has real eigenvalues, okay? So if the eigenvalues are all non-negative, it turns out that it's a global minimum at that extreme limit. If the eigenvalues are all non-positive, it turns out it's a global maximum. And that's for the matrix W. Like, again, it includes the imaginary part, okay? So that's the first theorem. The first theorem is that the complex structure of W gives us global information, okay? The second theorem allows us to say something more. Uh, now, in order to do that, we are gonna have to limit ourselves to what we call real symmetric periodic operators. And that just means that's, you know, for those of you who are familiar with this, it means we want the matrix to have time reversal symmetry, okay? Um, so we're gonna define a couple of points. So one set of points is the set of sort of so-called corner points, which just are the uh, end points like zero and pi at each corner of the torus representation. So this is, notice, this is where our complex exponential is always real, okay? And that's an important place because there W can be seen to be real. And hence, obviously this condition is easy to check, okay? Uh, so we have the following theorem. Take a real symmetric time reversible matrix representation of H T of alpha, okay? Then <clears throat> if you find a, uh, a local, Simple, a simple eigenvalue, okay, which is non-zero on any of the crossing edges, then uh, it's a global extremal value if that point is a, uh, an, a corner point, okay? If the dimension of the periodic lattice is less than or equal to two, okay? And there we use a trick, okay? So it turns out that we can learn something about the imaginary part of W and completely actually understand that the, that the uh, signature of W is given by the signature of real part of W in that setting. We can apply a same trick at 3D in the periodic lattice, as long as the, it's not greater than or equal or less than or equal to zero, but in fact, it's a non-degenerate we have something you know, genuinely positive or negative definite, okay? 
And for lattices that have periodic dimension bigger than four, in fact, I'll show you a counterexample, okay, that we computed. We just found one and uh, uh, this theorem doesn't hold, okay? We can find a local extrema that is not a global extrema. Um, but I will say uh, the previous theorem does still hold and I'll, and I'll show you that, okay? So one thing that I'll mention very quickly before I move on and I'll come back to this is that if we go back to main theorem one, um, this is, we'll talk about this uh, question. Is the converse true? If I have a global minimum, can I prove that W is non-negative? If I have a global maximum, can I prove that W is non-positive? We don't know that yet, but every numerical example that we have found um, seems to suggest that it's true. Okay. Again, using our conditions and the, the fact that we have uh, one crossing per edge. Okay. Okay, so questions about the theorems before I talk a little bit about the proof. Because I guess to some extent, the theorems I think are actually, the proofs are, you know, thanks completely to my co-authors are really lovely and I think easy to read uh, um, and use some very beautiful ideas from linear algebra uh, and uh, things like while bracketing uh, and some generalized uh, sure complement type formulae, okay? About, you know, related to Hermitian matrices. Um, I will present a few of the ideas and some of the key lemmas, um, but what I would really love for people to take away from this is an understanding of the statements. Uh, and so if there are any questions on those, I'm happy to answer them before I move on. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, the proof ideas are built around, so, you know, I should maybe give a little history of the problem. So, so Greg, Graham, Shiza, and I are part of an Ames Square program where we came together to talk about, uh, you know, geometric properties of eigenfunctions on graphs. And initially, we were thinking quantum graphs because Graham, Cox, Chris Jones, and myself had studied um, some like manifold gluing index formulae, which um, Graham, Greg, and I then were very, uh, Greg realized there was a nice interpretation of this through a spectral flow, and we were able to work on that together and give some geometric characterizations for separable problems. And uh, we were trying to kind of understand how to blend Greg's sort of magnetic point of view with our Dirichlet and Neumann point of view and get information, okay? And so we were kind of thinking really about quantum graphs and if there was any information that this kind of notion of, a, of uh, this lateral variation principle that Greg is working on with Peter Kuchman, which is about, really it's about self-adjoint linear realizations of elliptic operators, okay? And really asking, Ah, if I change a boundary condition in a graph, which is what our spectral flow really did, and in some sense, what you could say these magnetic characterizations really do, how that acts like a low rank perturbation to some extent, okay? Well, we don't have to, there's no, you know, debating that in this example. In this example, we have matrices, and we can determine whether or not we have low rank perturbations and what those ranks are and how much they can change a given eigen, eigenvector. Uh, sorry, I, how much they can change a given eigenvalue uh, using things like bio bracketing um, and uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, comparison theory. Okay. Okay. So the simplified point of view for us, since it really is just a matrix, is that what we're going to do is take that matrix parameterized by alpha, write it as something fixed plus some low rank perturbation. And then, you know, really understand how that perturbation at a given extremal point, at a given critical point, uh, can be determined and how much it can, so, how, what sort of the spectral shift is for, from S to T of alpha. So S is going to be fixed. T of alpha is going to vary all alphas globally. And if we can show that that spectral shift can't change an eigenvalue or change the ordering of the eigenvalues, then that must be a global extremum. That's really what we're going for. And so in order to do that, we need to take this perturbation 
understand it and uh, correctly approximate it by things that we can compute locally, okay? Okay, that's the cartoon, all right? So what do we have to do? So like I said, W is the complex Hessian to some extent, and uh, it's the actual Hessian at a quarter point, and it can be controlled by its real part for D less than or equal to three in ways that I mentioned. So what I really wanna focus on, because that tells us how to prove the second part of the theorem, is uh, focusing on how to prove main theorem one, okay? And uh, it's gonna follow from some understanding of the following type of Hermitian matrix, which if you're familiar with things like short complements or a so-called Hainsworth formula, you have absolutely seen before. But we're gonna take an, a Hermitian matrix that's constructed of these blocks. We have A, C, B star, and B, okay? And I'm gonna define the inertia of M as the following triple. Take the number of positive eigenvalues, the number of negative eigenvalues, and the number of zero eigenvalues, okay? If A, in this case, is non-singular, then there's this natural uh, sort of sure complement calculation where you define M mod A as C minus B star pseudo inverse of A, B, okay? Now I said pseudo inverse, it would be the actual inverse if A is non-singular, right? And uh, you can completely understand the inertia of M in terms of uh, uh, the inertia of A and the inertia of this given matrix, okay? So the, own, the main thing that we were able to modify in our paper, you know, in large part thanks to Greg and his familiarity with these Hainsworth formulae, is what if A is singular, okay? Well, it turns out there's a natural way to smooth that out, right? You could add, let's say in here, you could add, let's say A plus epsilon times the orthogonal projection, my apologies, orthogonal projection away from the null space of A. But when you do that calculation and you look at the eigenvalues, you realize that you get one over epsilons floating around in there. Okay, so that means that you could have something going to infinity and you need to count that in your index formula. So here's the statement for us, okay? Take that matrix with the block structure that we had before. And I will say this follows from an old result of Han Fujiwara and Jorgen uh, 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 Mober, uh, Rukman, and Tamer from the 80s, okay? There's a version they have of that block structure where M is the zero matrix. And that, in, that gives us everything we need to apply the standard Hainsworth formula in the right way, okay? And so the theorem is as follows. The inertia of M is equal to the inertia of A plus the inertia of Q of M mod A, where M mod A is defined as I saw previously, but on this null space, okay? And in particular restricted to that lower dimensional space, plus the positive piece, we have this infinite number. We have to add the infinite part. The negative piece, we have to add the infinite part. And we have to subtract the infinite part from the uh, zero piece as a total count, okay? Okay, and in particular, we can define what I infinity is. It is the number of infinite uh, eigenvalues that would occur from looking at M mod A, and it is exactly equal to the rank of B star B P, okay? Where P is this projection uh, onto the null space of A, okay? Which is pretty cool, at least I thought so. Um, there is also, I'll mention, there's a work by Yves Colon de Verdier from the late 90s that connected, the, the singular uh, Hainsworth type formula have been used in the past. This is not totally new, but exactly this form we hadn't seen before. Um, but uh, uh, Yves Colon de Verdier has a, a paper that connects these to so-called self-adjoint linear relations, which um, we're gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about in the future work section, okay? Okay, so long story short, is we take C to be omega and we plug in uh, 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 the, the, the matrix structure for that we would like to plug in for this operator, okay? So Q is gonna come from the null space of omega. A 
is going to be T minus lambda, um, and S is going to be the, the, the given restriction to Q of a given matrix. And we can compute all of these things exactly. And we can write down an index formula for W. OK? And that index formula says that the negative index is the negative index of omega, a negative index of S, an infinite, and a negative index of A, comparable for 0 and comparable for I plus. So that index formula is exactly what we're going to need because it's going to tell us when the spectral shift can be treated globally. OK? OK, and that's really what this, th this next one is, this vial bracketing statement. It is something about the spectral shift. OK? So in particular, uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the eigenvalue that we care about, right, it's going to be bounded from below by a given shifted eigenvalue of some matrix S, OK, which is lower dimensional, uh, and a given shifted vi value above one of which we'll use for the local min problem, one of which we'll use for the local max problem. And this matrix S, it turns out, is independent of alpha, OK? And there's a natural way that we can write it in terms of uh, uh, the perturbations so that we can, the, you know, the low rank perturbations that we can write off of T minus lambda. And that all has to do with the exact structure of how the one crossing edge for generator shows up in giving us these low rank perturbations, OK? And I am running a little bit low on time. So I, unless someone is really curious about what some of these underlying operators are, I would like to show you the examples and the, so you can really get a sense of how the theorem is being applied. Um, uh, if, 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 if people will forgive me that I didn't quite have enough time on the proof as I wanted to carefully write out what S is, it would take me a little bit of, machine, of, of notation. So if you will forgive me, uh, the point is uh, once we have that, once we have that uh, spectral shift theorem, it allows us to say uh, exactly when we get a global bound on lambda n of t of alpha zero in terms of t of alpha, and like I said, uh, when we're at a corner point, that gives us everything, and when we're not at a corner point, we can ask when is the real part of w enough to control all of w. And that's, that's what we're able to prove in the d less than or equal to 3 case, OK? And it has everything to do with generating something in the kernel from the eigenvector, which is not obvious. Um, but uh, it turns out that we can, we can state uh, something very precise about the structure of the spectrum of, of w, which helps us out a lot, OK? OK, I apologize for how quick that was, but I do want to show you a few examples, OK? So the first example, T of alpha, is exactly the T of alpha for the example that I showed you of the honeycomb lattice, OK? And it has the following structure. You have some on-site terms which connect. So here I've got uh, the way to think about the honeycomb lattice. The easiest way to think about it is, of course, it's called honeycomb because it forms a hexagon, right? What I really have is two copies of a lattice generated by, and I should have used some uh, other color, right? But I have two copies of a lattice generated by uh, 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 the, the Brion zone vectors of the equilateral triangle. And uh, I'm connecting these two elements would be inside a cell. And I would call this, say, the A sub lattice and this the B sub lattice, OK? So A and B, uh, I could have on-site terms that would just be like a potential. And then uh, the minus 1 comes from the intra intercell connection. And then the e to the i alpha 1 comes from the intracell connection between a and b, OK? Going through each of those edges, like I mentioned, the nice thing is about the parallelogram domain is it's super easy to see, OK? So this is the minus 1, and this would be alpha 1 Sorry, alpha one, alpha one bar. That's kind of the picture, OK? So you see this has exactly the structure that we want. And it turns out it has an interior critical point for a given choice. So in particular, we need to choose these positive, otherwise, uh, uh, sorry, and not equal to each other. 
I should say, not equal to each other, because otherwise you get a degeneracy point, just like I talked about Alexi studying before, okay? So uh, uh, the idea is if I take a slice of this, if these are equal, they are degenerate, but otherwise, if they are not equal, they open up and to form a gap, okay? And the point is, at these values, which are the extremal points, we uh, can compute and use our theorem to prove that they are global extrema, okay? You could, you could look at that point, only at that point, and show that it's a global extrema. Now, obviously, our theorem is maybe not so exciting for these low dimensional examples because it's low dimensions, right? Like uh, uh, <laughs> low dimensions, you could compute the eigenvalues of this matrix almost, you can do it explicitly and you, know, you could really explore the whole global structure, but it's nice to see all of the, all of the indices play out in a beautiful way according to the theorem, um, which we do in the paper. Um, at least I found it very satisfying. So the other example is this Lieb example where again, I'll remind you that here we have a three sublattice. Oh my gosh. Okay. And so now what we see is that B connects in cell to A and B, A and C, but also outside. And so that's what you see here, right? Here you have the connection. Uh, 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 a goes to B and C goes to B, okay? Okay, and these, in general, if they are zero, you would once again get actually a very interesting phenomenon. You would see a flat band and two degeneracies, but if they are not zero, and in fact, if you choose them to have alternating signals, so you go minus one, 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 then you get something that looks like this. Okay, and we can apply our theorem at these points. Okay, so here are the two examples, hexagon and Lieb, um, and our theorem holds in both of those cases and demonstrates that if you open up a gap in these cases, non-topological, the global extremum is the, the local extrema is a global extremum. Okay, now to, to give an example of theorem one that does not hold for theorem two, we took an example of Harrison, Kuchman, Sobolev, and Wynn. Now they were able to construct an example graph that has an interior uh, extremal point, okay? And it happens to be degenerate. Uh, well, it may not happen to be, that may be a generic phenomenon. But anyway, it's a degenerate interior critical point for this. Uh, you see, we've got five, n is equal to five here, okay? Well, what we did was we took that model and we added in a little magnetic field on one edge, okay? If you vary beta, you can draw the dispersion surfaces and it's, I hope it's clear. Here you have degeneracy, right? That's the interior critical point. And here we've split it up. So we have an, a global extremum and we have local. And here they're both. Okay? And we look at W in each of these cases, and we realize that here W is uh, de negative definite, and here it is, is not signed. It's not, it does not have a clear signature. So this is, gives you this a restatement of the conjecture, which would be that our first theorem, um, could, you could state the, state the converse as well. Okay? Now, lastly, I'll show you one example of a multiple edges per generator, uh, which, so, so here's the point. I have one edge, two edge. Now I added a third edge crossing by adding an on-site crossing. And this has, uh, uh, it has, well, in this case, the minima is what you can look at, right? I have, a, I have a local minimum that is clearly not the global minimum, okay? All right. And uh, for D greater than or equal to four, we completely built a numerical example by building Hermitian, Hermitian random graphs and looking at the one edge per crossing. And indeed, once again, we compute two critical points, one at a corner and one not at a corner for the first band, 
And indeed, we go see that one is a local extremum that is not a global extremum. However, I will say that uh, <laughs> the sign indefinite co condition still held. So our conjecture could still easily be true we, uh, uh, it, for this example. OK? OK. Uh, really quick, future work. This was on combinatorial graphs. We'd love to do the same for quantum graphs. But now, instead of low rank matrix perturbations, they're boundary condition perturbations. So we need this lateral variation principle of Kuchman and Berkeleyko, Berkeleyko Kuchman. Once we have that, we should be in good shape. We have essentially all the details worked out. The second thing is I mentioned that we know what happens if you transform the fundamental domain. But if you use a unitary transformation, you also screw up this calculation in a very interesting way, a way we haven't fully concluded on what's going on yet. So the impact of our local to global statement on unitary transformations is also an open question. And in related fashion, if you use more than one crossing edge per generator, is there anything you can say? And can you really use this W condition uh, to still at least understand when you're at a global, OK, uh, uh, in some fashion? Okay, last thing I'll say is thank you to the Ames Institute for facilitating this work. If you've never done a four square, it's actually pretty fun and very productive. And thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for this nice talk. Uh, I know you're teaching soon, but we have time for a few questions, I guess. Yeah, I have, I have 22 minutes, so. Okay, so um, if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, now is the good time for it. Please go ahead. You can write it in the chat or just uh, speak up. So if you look at the space of lattices, uh, then, so you have this one uh, crossing per edge condition, right? Uh, uh, so in the space of like two-dimensional, three-dimensional lattices, ca can you mark the lattices that are good for uh, your theorem and, and like the boundary of that and then the lattice is that where this does not hold. Uh, yeah, and so in, in the end, the best way I sort of know how to do it is with that picture of the fundamental domain, right? So take the mm -hmm. fundamental domain and look at the hopping edges you have uh, that cross that fundamental domain. And if for one of those edges, it is more than one uh, edge crossing, then that is not going to fit into our theorem. And so, so the, the boundary condition would be when one of these hopping edges crosses a corner, because that's... Yeah, and that would still count as, as, as two crossings per an edge. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, okay. And uh, so sometimes people look at not uh, Z to the D periodic, but uh, some, uh, you know, like Nilpotent group or amenable group or something, some tilings. Uh, uh, with a different group that, uh, in some problems. Yeah, like so indeed, if you, if you have a brevet lattice, for instance, and so 2D, my most familiar case is, is you have some, some brevet lattice generated by two linearly independent vectors, um, which then you use as the generator of the lattice tiling um, through the dual lattice structure. That is a that is diffeomorphic to the to the square, and as a result, uh, our 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 theorem still holds. So any brevet lattice type structure, we could still work it. We just worked with the toroidal fundamental domain because it made our life a little bit easier. Yeah, but like in 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 three D, sometimes there is this. Uh, but 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 do do you think that your kind of results could also hold for? Uh, you know, Heisenberg group tiling? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, okay. No, it's just, uh, I, I've seen, I think, not, not for your problem, but for some other problems, some work. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I, do, I, things that are, things that are not sort of your standard group lattice tilings, uh, I, you know, it's possible as long as you can understand the low rank structure and you have a good parameterization of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the spectrum in terms of that fundamental domain through your group. In our case, the fact that the, you know, the group structure was rotation uh, is helpful in our calculations. 
But if you can okay. understand the group structure and differentiate with respect to it, then you could probably say something. But uh, I won't. I won't make any claims of what you could say. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else have uh, questions or comments? Please go ahead. Um, I, I I would have one. I mean, it, it's um, uh, obviously a biased question, considering the kind of things that I I usually look at. But um, when you when you have your in, in your future work, you start you talk about extending this from combinatorial graphs to quantum graphs. Uh, would it be possible? You think that the that similar methods would also be able to tell us about something about global uh, maxima of the dispersion relation in the continuum case, or it has a completely different structure that doesn't make uh, these methods yeah. applicable. Okay, so here's what you need, and here's where the quantum graph structure is somewhat important. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can characterize a magnetic type, or you know you can characterize this mm -hmm. structure on a quantum graph as a vertex condition. Yeah. yeah. So the point is, it, you, you you completely turn this problem into a family of vertex conditions and a family of boundary conditions in the quantum graph. And that you can certainly treat as low rank. And mm -hmm. otherwise, uh, uh, one needs, and so, pr so probably, but let me say this, I won't state it confidently until um, I really read the exact structure of Greg and Peter's lateral variation principle, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, because that the sort of implicit low rank nature is, is what we're really keen on in the quantum graph case because it can be worked with boundary conditions. But in principle, uh, I agree with you that uh, the underlying idea is as long as you could parameterize that, uh, the, the family over which you're operating, you could still hopefully apply similar ideas. And the key thing would be understanding the, the, the spectral shifts. And that's really what we need with the low rank structure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Do you does uh, anyone else have a question or comments about the mathematics we heard today? If not, I think we should thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you all.